Are there things that would um, you see individuals cause backsliding? For example, cannabis use or alcohol. So they're on a great trajectory where you're doing the EEG, you're treating them with a magnet, you're putting them on very specific protocols, you're matching their wavelengths. I know that there are certain brain waves that are active during sleep that are supposed to be slower during waking. And those oftentimes there's a reversal of that in a traumatic brain injury. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, especially with cannabis being uh, a bit more normalized these days, we do see slowing of brain activity. And uh, I don't want to be kind of a, a, a preachy guy or anything like that, but there should be some awareness that both alcohol and cannabis, um, these are compounds that will slow down brain activity. And uh, it's very hard for us to overcome that. So we do see people backslide with regular use of these things. Um, what does it do when you say slowing brain activity? Would that be, there just be processing speed? Were there other things that happen? It is processing speed. And so uh, we reinforce specifically alpha activity of the brain, which is uh, the cycle rate that your brain processes information generally between 8 and 13 hertz, which means we encode information 8 to 13 times per second. Um, Mine's more like 7. No, <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. But these slower brain waves, kind of 7, between like four and seven, we call theta. And then slower than that, we call delta. Those are your sleepy brain waves. And so when you're stage one, stage two sleep, you're generally in theta, and then we move into delta. And with the slower brain waves, we're able to restore our ATP and people get deeper, more restorative sleep and are refreshed for the next day. Um, now, during our wakeful hours, you should see mostly alpha and then beta activity is more of your fast wave activity. Uh, that's associated with um, complex thinking, complex processes, lots of sensory inputs. Um, but you will see in the wakeful hours, people who use alcohol and cannabis excessively, more theta activity than we want to. And so that's where we talk about the slowing of the activity. Uh, they may feel like they're in a bit of a fog. Mm. And, and that's what we're trying to prevent. If an uh, individual were to remove that without treatment from um, additional stimuli from the magnet, would so you remove the alcohol, you remove the cannabis, do their brain waves return to normal, or it's there's no other way to flip the switch than, or is there than transmagnetic stimulation? Right, the the body doesn't naturally go back to a normal rhythm, does it? So there's a lot of variables involved, and. So the quick answer, it depends on uh, somebody's age, neuroplasticity, uh, and what are the other behaviors that uh, are associated with the individual. So if somebody's taking really good care of themselves and they smoke a joint one night, you know, they're probably going to be just fine. Um, if they're heavy smokers over years, uh, the recovery may be slower or the brain may reorganize in a way or it's just operating a little bit slower. And so uh, there are many things people can do to optimize brain function. Uh, we've touched on some of them. Exercise, very very few things are as useful to brain function as exercise. Um, do you care what kind? It doesn't matter to me so much what kind. I think, you know, movement is always um, the key. Even, you know, for the elderly population, even just walking is helpful. Uh, we do push-ups before the podcast. I heard that on your last podcast. We didn't do it today, but maybe we did push up. So oh, you Matt, did. so I have a really good friend who, um, uh, she's amazing, and she was a former Secret Service agent. And she said, I said, you know, like, hey, Evie, should we do push ups together? And she's like, Gabrielle, you want your guests to be relaxed and be able to be in the flow. You and Matt can do push ups, but <laughs> don't you dare rope that guest into it. I was like, okay, <laughs> you're right. That's impressive. That's impressive. Um, yeah, so I, I try not to be too prescriptive in terms of saying, you know, hit exercise is the best or uh, I know resistance training is one But I that... think intensity matters. I think, you know, when it comes to blood flow and, uh, you know, there seems to be different metabolic changes, just looking at Martin Kabbalah's work and I, I think maybe intensity yeah. matters, but anything is better than nothing. Yeah. You, you did remind me of one of the things where we, we had sort of clicked at uh, Soft Week. 
based on a discussion, uh, this was George Brooks's work at UC Berkeley, where he was specifically, he spent, as a neuroscientist, who spent quite a bit of his career studying the lactate shuttle. And so if there was any question about whether exercise helps brain function, we can dispel that notion. There's a clear correlation. And what they found is that, you know, growing up, we always associated lactate and lactic acid as a negative byproduct of exercise. We get sore muscles. But it turns out lactate is a preferred fuel for the brain. And this lactate shuttle specifically, not only is it providing fuel for the brain, um, but it's also increasing the amount of vascular endothelial growth factor. So it's increasing vascularity through the blood-brain barrier, something called VEGF, which also increases the amount of um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a proxy for neuroplasticity. And so we, we're learning at a cellular level how exercise can improve and upregulate brain function. Mm -hmm. So, and to develop lactate, to your point, the intensity actually matters quite a bit. Yeah. I, I mean, again, I think that that's fascinating. I'm so glad that you pointed that out because we think about exercise as medicine. There are lots of things that someone could do that wouldn't be good for their brain, like stacking drinking and no sleep and smoking a lot of pot and not exercising. <laughs> but the thing that sounds like a terrible, don't do that. But the things that we can do that really make an impact are working really hard physically to the point where you're producing lactate and uh, allowing that to be fuel for the brain, choosing a really good healthy diet, sleeping, which I'm guilty that I don't, I, I know I need to, but again, I have two little kids. They like to come and wake us up a million times a <laughs> night. Uh, it just might not be a realistic thing. But when you think about improving individuals' cognitive function, that that's part of it. The um, when my husband went, and by the way, so he didn't have any, no, I'm sure he had blast injuries. Um, you know, they, there's just because, uh, breaching and doing all that stuff. And, you know, even micro injuries, when you, you shoot guns, there's like micro trauma that happens. One of the things that they had, uh, told him was to be very particular about sunlight was to be very particular about being outside, something about melatonin, something about blue light. I don't know if any of that has changed. This is this was a couple of years ago when he got treated. Were, are there certain other things that you recommend for patients and brain health? Yes, I, I love that you brought that up because um, there were two Nobel Prizes awarded for the discovery of blue light. And uh, so, were you one of them? No, no, I wish. No, <laughs> as I, a matter of fact, yes. Uh, you know, I wasn't privileged enough to be part of that team, but. Blue light specifically is 450 to 500 nanometer light. It's richest in morning sunlight. And this is our first biological cue to start our circadian rhythm. And so the advice is to be outside uh, sometime during your first wake, waking hours and to get natural unfiltered blue light into your eyes. And when you do that, there's a specific receptor in your eye called the melanopsin that sends a signal we just learned about this yesterday, yeah. by the way. Yeah. So it sends a signal to your suprachiasmatic nucleus that will tell your pineal gland to release melatonin roughly 14 to 16 hours later. Mm. So the second part of that is, is you have to listen to your biology. And at the first sign of nighttime somnolence, usually between 9 and 10 p.m., you do actually have to get into bed because when your melatonin spikes, you know, there's a short window and if you fall asleep at that time, you'll get very deep restorative sleep. That's amazing. And if you miss that window... You may stay up quite a, quite a bit. Now that all makes sense. 